This is Jennifer Kirschenbaum. Thank you for joining us for new HIPAA enforcement actions and what they mean for your practice. I'm sorry, it's uh, been a bit of a break before um, we've gotten back to our webinar series, but we'll be trying our best to continue our education for our clients and uh, soon to be clients um, on a going forward basis. So uh, many of you know me, most of you are members of our listserv and uh, some of you participate on a, on a regular basis and we welcome questions as they come in. I'm gonna to try to keep this to more of a lunch and learn, so I'll try to get through the material fairly quickly, but I think it's very important for us to cover what's been happening at the government level oversight-wise, so that way we can understand what preventative measures we should be taking on the day-to-day -day now to protect our practices um, from potential review or complaint by patients. So before I get started, I'm just gonna briefly go over some of the services that our firm does, because it would be um, negligent on my part not to mention, but I am the managing partner of our healthcare division, many of you know that, and I spend my days doing majority compliance work and transactional, so all of your papering for all of your staff, all of your vendors, all of your partnership deals, um, all of that stuff you can call me with and any compliance concerns you may have, obviously HIPAA, kickback, uh, as I mentioned, vendor relationships, business associate relationships. I also oversee um, and, and work on um, audit defense issues with insurance companies, uh, government payers. Um, we have a, a number of U.S. attorney defense cases going on uh, for False Claims Act that I, I work on, uh, on, a, on a daily basis. And I oversee strategy for our litigation uh, for the healthcare as well with uh, some of my partners that uh, do healthcare litigation. Um, and leasing is part of our transactional department, which I work on. Um, we do help many of our clients with collections for uh, against patients, uh, insurance companies are a bit tougher, depends on the facts, but we have been involved in those as well. Other general categories that we can uh, assist with uh, in our firm are of course, employment, which I get involved in, real estate for the leasing I get involved in, sales are handled by a uh, different uh, aspect, and um, we have matrimonial, bankruptcy, uh, general litigation, and wills and estates. Okay, so now that we've covered the basics, um, today's discussion is very important because government investigation is one of my major concerns um, for the majority of my clients and uh, some of the other areas of concern that are kind of the big three that I consider categories of major exposure are listed right here. So government investigation, um, which can be initiated by complaint of a, a patient or an employee, possibly, um, Medicare audit or audit in general, um, if you are under audit and uh, your account receivables are not coming in, obviously that is a big problem and we can't operate, and employee class action. So those are some of the three areas that I like to make sure we have some compliance in place for. Some basic information on HIPAA, just to make sure that we are covered. Um, we know what it is, all of us on the call, and we know that it, it governs patient privacy. And it's made up of three different components, the security rule, uh, was added, the breach notification rule was added, and the privacy rule is the foundation uh, for the statute. So, what's changed and why are we having today's call? Well, with the implementation of the security rule and the innovations in technology, obviously there's a lot more um, to be concerned about with the electronic data. So we have to up our games on the compliance end. We all have to abide by HIPAA. I'm assuming that's why we're on this call. So any healthcare provider, which is probably who we are, um, and possibly maybe a business associate uh, to a healthcare provider, we are required to adhere to the requirements for HIPAA. What is protected under HIPAA? Any and all individually identifiable patient information. So that would include, and this is an issue I dealt with yesterday, an audio recording, if you decide you wanna start recording uh, audio and each each patient uh, encounter, depending on which state you are, there's different laws that apply to audio and consent. Um, but an image, a license number, any identifying information at all, social security number, name, um, uh, specifics to um, actual health information for the visit, all of that constitutes HIPAA information. Breach reporting, what is it? We are required since uh, 2013 to notify the secretary of HHS for any unsecured uh, protected health information 
that is disclosed not in conformance with HIPAA. So that could be a lot of stuff. And the thing is, we don't want to have to start reporting things unless they actually qualify as a breach. So today's webinar, the reason why I wanted to have it to give you some additional information is because of this case. And when we say that it's recent and you see these dates and you see 2014, you're going to say, Jennifer, this is old news. It's not old news because it was just settled in 2017. And um, I probably should have done this a couple of months ago, but, but I'm getting to it now and I apologize. But this is, in my mind, a seminal case. And I'll explain to you why that is. This presence health system is one of the largest healthcare networks serving Illinois. They have a, a huge infrastructure, tremendous amount of, of locations and different types of providers. And um, they received or had internally a breach. It was determined that they had a breach. They discovered that paper-based operating room schedules, which contained protected health information for 836 individuals were missing. Now, 836 individuals, I'm not sure over what time span that was. I don't know if that was for one month or several months or a day. I don't know. I don't have that information. But I know that that information was not necessarily maintained on a tremendous amount of paper because it could have been listed on an Excel format or double-sided, and it could have been a small packet. And they could have realized, you know, at some point later date or an employee made an admission at a later date uh, that, that this went missing. And any one of us could walk out of a room by accidentally picking up an additional folder. Things happen. And HIPAA allows for that, which we're going to talk about. They allow for human error. But here, and the reason why this is so notable, is the incident supposedly took place on October 22nd of 2013. I'm going to conjecture that someone walked out of the operating room and picked up the wrong folder, and then we weren't sure where it landed. On January 31st, 2014, so that's October, November, December, January, so it's three months, just over three months, OCR was notified of a breach notification report from Presence Health. In the grand scheme of things for day to day, when you have a large system that is bureaucratic and you have compliance hurdles and you have a reporting infrastructure and you have general counsel or outside counsel getting involved, three months is a time frame that many would say is actually not super unreasonable. It's outside of the 60 day window that OCR requires for a breach of more than 500 people. And we'll get to the requirements for breach notification. But what was interesting is this is the first time that I've seen this agency fine for missing the deadline. And that is, in my mind, substantial. And the amount of money is not insignificant for any system, really. No, I mean, I guess you could argue that some systems are so large, Kaiser or some of the large hospitals on the East Coast, or some of the systems are big enough for $500,000 maybe, you know, is not going to impact a bottom line. But, but somebody's taking a hit there. It's a lot of money. So this system waited probably an extra about 45 days to report that this packet of paper went missing. And to settle, they had to pay almost $500,000 for lack of timely notice of breach. Now, what else is interesting here for me is nothing else was cited in the press release that's, that's on the bottom, which you can go read yourself if you'd like. So in other words, the government came in and they, they went through, uh, presumably, you know, having, I represent providers on these type of reviews all the time. So I would imagine that the office came in and they looked at all the the compliance procedures that the system had. Nothing was noted as lacking. Um, they went through the review process that the, 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 uh, the center did, and they didn't find anything faulty with it. And it was clear that the breach was required to be reported, which it actually, in fact, was. And at the end of that, they didn't cite any noncompliance at all 
except for the failing to, to disclose within the time period. So to frame it another way, and maybe hopefully this will land on the mark that I'm trying to hit. In my experience, when the government institutes an investigation, whether it's for untimely reporting, which is here, and this is a first for me to see, and it's notable, or it's for a kickback case or a false claims act case or Medicaid paying inappropriately for services that were not medically necessary. A lot of those reviews when they're instituted is subjective on whether or not the practice or the facility really in fact did something that was wrong. You know, there's a, a very fine line um, and it's very, it's, it's not a fine line, it's very blurry on whether or not something was intentional or not intentional, wrong, not wrong. Um, and the headlines that we see that are raised by the government are, are sensationalized in a way that it's, as a defense attorney, which I am, uh, is incredible. It's all for the headlines. So here, what I see when I read this is, this is the best they could come up with. This system probably is doing so much right and has taken a lot of steps to be in compliance. And it was all they could come up with to recoup money for the effort that they put in for this investigation was the failing of the deadline. Because if not, we would have seen a lot of other things in this opinion that there's non-compliance, there's this, there's that, and it's not here. It's just about the, the missing the timeline. So this is, eyebrow raising because it shows a whole nother level of review that's 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 being done by OCR and it also brings up the need for proper timely reporting. So um, just really quickly I'm going to give you two very quick examples that you may have already heard us talk about before in prior webinars. They were uh, published earlier um, uh, September 2015. This is an example. We had a laptop stolen from an employee's car from Cancer Care Group and the settlement was almost, uh, it was three quarters of a million dollars, $750,000 they had to pay back uh, to the Office for Civil Rights because they lost a laptop. And the finding here was, was that basically the cancer care group was not in compliance with the HIPAA security rule. Uh, they did not do a risk analysis when the breach occurred. There was no written policy uh, specific to removal of hardware, which is required by statute. And um, there were issues raised as to how the, the actual um, just loss of the laptop was handled internally. So this is what I'm talking about. This was not addressed in the recent presence health determination. And this is OCR coming in and saying, you're not complying. You owe the money to us because we made a rule, you're required to follow it, you didn't follow the rules. And they cited a ton of non-compliance. Um, the preventative compliance was in the first example. This was also a clear breach, and I, I don't mind uh, bringing up negative things that an insurance company has done, so that's why I highlight the Affinity Health Plan. Um, but Affinity um, returned copiers after a lease was up, which we all have, and um, HHS required that they pay back $1.2 million um, for failing to wipe the, the copiers of, of uh, over 300,000 patients' information. So. Um, and the citation here was uh, basically that they didn't properly assess risk and vulnerabilities. But again, this is a much bigger issue. This is information that was actually um, out there in the world and, and, a, and a problem that was addressed. We don't even know if that schedule that that employee walked out of from the operating room in the presence health scenario made it into wide range dissemination. And we're gonna talk about breach notification now. I'm gonna go through what the requirements are so that we understand what really is supposed to be done. Um, so you can see quickly um, what steps should be taken. And I, I think you'll, you'll kind of understand the gravity of the new opinion and why I felt it was important for us to address it today. So a breach, as we talked about, is basically a disclosure uh, in any manner that's not permitted by HIPAA. And what disclosures are authorized just quickly? Obviously to the individual patient for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations, pursuant to valid authorization by agreement or for required to disclose by law. Um, 
And uh, if anyone has any questions on these, they can obviously email me after and I'll be happy to address it most likely for the newsletter. So what does a breach exclude? And this is very important. Any unintentional access or use by someone who's authorized. So who's authorized? People who work for us that we have under some sort of contract or policy. Um, you wanna make sure that we have all of our policies in place, whether it's through an employee handbook or a workforce agreement. Um, we wanna make sure that everyone we have with access through our practice or facility actually is signed off on agreeing to uh, maintain confidentiality for patient information. Um, and if you don't have that in place, that's something that has to be done immediately. Uh, disclosure from one authorized person to another authorized person, this would include from covered entity to covered entity. Uh, disclosure from covered entity or business associate, where we have a good faith belief the unauthorized person um, would not reasonably have been able to retain such information. So um, where is that going to happen? Well, let's say you post something to um, a portal and uh, you remove the information from the portal before you, you can see that the person has accessed it. Okay, well, we sent something, we posted it, we know they never looked at it, we took it down. We're still required to document that there was a mistake in the posting and that we took it down. But we can easily also document that the unauthorized person to whom the disclosure was made um, did not reasonably have uh, the ability to maintain the information or retain it. Um, a low probability of compromise. This requires a full assessment on whether or not there actually was a disclosure that constitutes a breach. And this is something I would recommend you engage with your counsel for a number of reasons. Number one, it's, it's more of a legal analysis that's going to be done, obviously fact-based, but also you wanna make sure that you can point a finger somewhere else um, and that an, a third party that's willing to take responsibility for the assessment is actually on board and signing off on it. And that's one of the reasons uh, just from a CYA uh, covering yourself perspective, you would call counsel and say, look, I think I, I may have potentially have had a disclosure that might constitute a breach. We don't like to throw around the B word because once you start throwing around the B word, in my mind, you immediately have a duty to report. And I like to keep the government out of your facility whenever I can um, because I don't think anything good can come of uh, a, a government review generally and then sometimes our hands are tied and we have to report um, in a timely manner which is what today's discussion is about so low probability of compromise will do the assessment the nature and extent of the protected health information the unauthorized person who accessed it whether the phi was actually acquired or viewed and to the extent to which the risk uh, has been mitigated and we can document all of that there's two kinds of breaches there's small breaches which is less than 500 individuals impacted and then there's big breaches, more than 500. And we have different rules. If there's a big breach, you have 60 days to notify the government um, that there was a breach. And you're required to include, um, oh, this, sorry, this is to the individual, but it's the government as well, 60 days. Uh, the individual, you're required to tell the nature of the breach, and um, we have to make sure that the individual gets it. So email, let's talk about that. Your patients have to tell you that they're willing to accept notice and communication from you by email. And that should be in writing. So make sure that that's on your patient registration forms. And if you need help with your patient registration forms, just let us know. We're happy to assist you in revising language that's gonna be appropriate for release. Um, if you can't find the patient, substitute notice is required. You are required to post on your homepage if you have a website for at least 90 days about the breach. This is for a large breach. Provide notice in a major print or broadcast media. This is the big problem. You know, you're basically going to be shutting yourself down, putting yourself out of business by, by uh, deterring patients from wanting to go to you because it's going to be very public. You need to have to maintain a toll-free number. This is still um, in the statute. I, I do not believe this has been revised. So you actually have to take affirmative steps and set up a line where people can call to learn if their information was involved in the breach. It's a lot of requirements. Um, the, the media notice is obviously a big thing. Uh, so we have to notice uh, prominent media outlets serving the state of the jurisdiction, and it's going to be very public and must be provided without unreasonable delay in no case later than 60 days. So the 60-day notification is a big deal. Notice to the secretary, 60 days, you have to tell the government, and here's a link to report. So I'll leave that up for just another minute if anyone wants to copy that down. You'll be able to find it online, or I can provide it if you ask. A small breach... Notice to the secretary. You're required to, at the end of the calendar year, now again, not every disclosure is a breach. 
a breach is what we talked about. It's only if the disclosure was made not in accordance or justifiably in accordance with the HIPAA statute, uh, or you know, more specifically with how your office is, is interacting with patients related to HIPAA. We need to make sure that your consents are in place and that you have proper authorization uh, from the patients to use the information the way that you want. That's the most important. Um, each, each entity should be doing some sort of assessment on an annual basis within the time frame, which is the end of the calendar year, even another 60 day grace period. Um, but really I would say by you know, November, you should be thinking about this and January, we should be wrapping up any assessment to see if there's anything that we have to report. And uh, here's the link for reporting for any, any disclosures to under 500 people. A business associate, which are vendors that have more than um, incidental access to our protected health information. So let's talk about people who are business associates. 1,000% your billing company um, who has access to your system. If you have an IT person that comes in and has access to your system on a regular basis, absolutely they constitute a business associate. Um, not, not Verizon, who just provides you your IP address and you pay a, a, a fee to, uh, for internet, they don't have access to your system, so you wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't uh, put them in the business associate category. But any business associate who actually has access to the information absolutely must be under contract. So um, if you don't have those in place and you don't have proper legal language in the agreements saying that the business associate is going to take 100% responsibility for any errors on their part, that's something that we need to remedy immediately um, and take very seriously. Proactive HIPAA protection, and I'm only going to speak for another few minutes and let everyone go back to their day. Um, this is what I recommend that should be in place, okay? We have to understand the reporting requirements, which we just went through, and uh, we have to follow them. So we really need to be documenting, and this requires a level of transparency and mandating your employees adhere to this level of transparency on their mistakes, because the majority of HIPAA violations come from human error. So we need to make sure that we're maintaining an infrastructure where our employees know that there's a report up um, required process and that they will not be penalized assuming that they do tell you if there's a mistake. They have to understand there are severe ramifications for trying to cover up um, and saving face, which of course, you know, a lot of times is what their tendency is going to be. Um, we have to train properly and have regular education on this. So if we're having any kind of staff meetings on a fairly regular basis, which hopefully we are, um, we need to make sure this is a topic that we're doing. And if anyone wants me to do uh, something remotely or even come in for training, you just have to let me know and I'm happy to help schedule that. Typically, we don't need a lot of time, which is why I normally do it remotely. I don't normally go to the site because it's just not um, cost efficient for uh, for you to have me do that, but we can certainly do a webinar with staff or um, a face uh, a teleconference um, is fine, a video conference, um, I'm happy to. And uh, we wanna make sure that we understand what disclosures are not authorized that have to be reported up. We're going to also engage in a security risk assessment on a regular basis, which I'll talk about in a second. I'll go back to it. Policies and procedures addressing HIPAA exposure. Um, this is what I recommend. Obviously, our patient forms have to be in good good form, so we need certain consents. If you're taking photos uh, and using them in the patient chart, or like I said, if you're looking to use audio, um, that 100% needs to be properly consented to. And some of this language for the HIPAA stuff can be put actually into your informed consents for your procedures. And th that's where I like to couch some of it, also in the registration forms. Workforce agreements. This is a general category, but I have, happen to have a specific contract that I utilize for a workforce agreement. Um, whether you have a full employee handbook or not, some of us listening may have you know, only one to five staff members and be a smaller practice, and you may not wanna do a whole full scale um, massive compliance program that's gonna be costly. You might wanna keep it simple. Well, we have some solutions for you to do that as well. But people who are in your office and have access to patient information need to be under some sort of document where we can show that as the employer or head of, head of the, uh, the practice, we are taking affirmative steps to make sure that individuals with access to our patient information are aware that they're covered by these legal responsibilities to maintain in a proper manner. So I do that through workforce agreements. 
a breach notification policy. We should have this on file. This is a contract, not a contract, it's a policy um, that kind of is a contract because we're requiring adherence to it, um, that tells our staff or trains our staff, specifically our security officer, what do we have to watch out for and what do we do with it if there's actually a disclosure? So uh, that's important to have on file because it's just for process. And also, if we do have a review by Office for Civil Rights, um, whether it's because we've had a self-report or we are reported, it's very easy to make a complaint to OCR. Um, we want to make sure that we can show the government that we've gone far enough to actually put compliance in place. So that way, yeah, we do training on breach. You know, here's our records from our training program and here's the compliance that we have in place. A security agreement is required. Um, this is if you're using a laptop in your computer, not just a laptop, but any electronic communication whatsoever um, uh, related to the internet for patient information, you're required to have a security agreement. And this document talks about your administrative, physical, and technical safeguards that you have in place for HIPAA information at your practice. And the administrative is what we're talking about right here. It's the uh, patient forms and policies and agreements that you have with your staff. The physical is actual locks on your system, right? And uh, plenty of other things that the government talks about, and we'll go, we'll go through that in a minute, um, briefly. And the technical safeguards, you're really gonna work mostly with your IP provider, your IT provider, uh, to make sure that we have proper locks and safeguards in our system uh, to make sure that we are in adherence. So, uh, that's what I wanted to cover today. And of course, many of you know um, about our newsletter, and that's how you learned about our webinar today. Uh, this is one of our generic uh, links to our website, but NewYorkHealthCareAttorneys.com will get you there. You can sign up for our newsletter. Uh, this is my bio. Now, I just wanted to quickly go here for you. This is a security risk assessment website uh, through HealthIT.gov, who worked in conjunction with OCR. And they put together a, an assessment tool that you can use to uh, go through the different safeguards that are required. And it's actually a very helpful questionnaire um, for each of these. And you'll see that as you open it, which I'm not gonna open it now, um, a lot of the questions are repetitive. Do you have a data destruction plan in place? Do you have proper locks in your system? Um, and there's a lot of questions, there's over 100 questions. But you can download the tool here and I recommend that with the help of your attorney, which our office is of course happy to help, um, you, uh, you implement uh, a, a testing, a proper testing in conjunction with your IT provider, and we make sure that you have proper safeguards in place for the electronic information you're using. Another resource, if you uh, know that you don't have um, certain policies in place that you do need, is this is our main page of our website. Many of you know where that is, or you have the link. And we have right here a compliance page and if you scroll down to the compliance page, if you do need some of these documents, you'll notice that we have um, uh, for flat fee, a number of documents we can put in place for your practice. And here's the employee handbook. This has some HIPAA um, agreements in it and policies. And on top of that, we have our generic um, HIPAA compliance documents that we customize for your practice if you need to order anything. So notice the privacy practices, um, this covers pretty much everything. Here's your security policy, breach notification policy that you need to have on file, consent for disclosure with your patients. Um, this talks about payment, your financial disclosure. And then we have also an all-in-one if you think you kind of need everything, um, including the workforce agreement. So um, this is what we offer uh, to assist and make sure that everything is, is uh, on the up and up with the practice. And um, I'm happy to take uh, questions, which I think is probably easier to do uh, by email, if anyone has any. I think that there were some, but they're difficult to do on here. Um, no, one of them I got is, do you forward the slides? No, I do not forward the slides. And uh, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry, some of these are very long. Okay, I'm gonna have everyone email me if you have a direct question or I'll try to go through the, the ones that came in and, and email you back directly. And uh, just so you do have my information, again, I think all of you do, but um, there's my information. And if you have any questions on HIPAA or you have any concerns based on what we talked about today that you need to have some additional assistance, putting some 
policies and protocols in place. You all know how to reach me and uh, I will keep you posted on future lectures that we will be doing and I wish you a wonderful day and a happy end to the summer.